And because he lives, the prophet Isaiah can tell us, as it says there, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. And um, it's because he's not a dead God. He's a living God. And therefore, we can have hope. Well, it's nice to see everyone here this morning, and um, it's very nice to see you here, Walter. Um, and so we're very excited for that. And um, um, my wife and I, we were gone this past week, and uh, we were at our district conference. Um, and um, we have a we have an excellent district uh, that we're that we're part of. I think. It's probably one of the top districts in our denomination. Um, I haven't, I'll confess, I've 
I don't know what the other districts are like, so, <laughs> but um, I have heard from others outside of our district that we have excellent, and I think you saw the, the slide that was going back and forth there, and just the fact that, you know, we are a part of a denomination, uh, the EFCA, the Evangelical Free Church of America, and in Minnesota alone, we have 173 churches, and we have 10 churches that are in the process of just recently being planted, and hopefully within the next couple of years uh, will be um, churches. We had 963 baptisms this past year. We had 50, there are 53,000 people in the state of Minnesota who attend an evangelical free church. That's a lot of people. Now, that's just evangelical free church. You can imagine there's um, Converge. There's other um, believers in other denominations, but in our denomination, there's 53,000 people who attend uh, an EFCA church. And uh, um, our, partly why our, um, I say our district staff is some of the best, they drove 81,000 miles last year to visit churches. Um, and so I, um, I know that, you know, two years ago, or maybe three years ago, 1920, or excuse me, 1922 was the birth of this church, and in 2022, this church celebrated their 100th year celebration, and you had the president of the Free Church, Kevin Complin, come out to uh, speak. And, and that just shows the fact that even at the top of our denomination, they, they're concerned about every church. And it's not like they, they just go visit the big churches. No, they, they visit every church that is out there. And so um, we can be thankful for our church denomination. Um, some announcements. You'll, you'll notice that um, this coming Saturday, we are going to be meeting in the fellowship hall to pray for our schools, to pray for the students that attend our schools. I mean, it's incredibly important that we, we do that because they're the ones that are going to be working at, as nurses, doctors. They're going to be, you know, working in the nursing homes. Someday we'll probably end up in one. Um, someday I'll have to go to a clinic and I'll need a doctor. It's these students that will be doing this, and they will be doing my taxes. Um, and, sorry, I didn't mean to say that negative word. Um, but they need our prayers. And so come Saturday to do that. Also next Sunday is our testimony and hymn sing, and then we will have a, a potluck, and then our quarterly meeting for that. Also, this is just something to just to put on your on your calendar. Uh, you're thinking about um, this summer. Last summer, we we hosted a couple of five day clubs, just neighborhood, you know, kind of like neighborhood backyard Bible clubs type thing. And we're hoping to do uh, some more this summer. We have three from our church who have who are praying about and have put in their application for being involved in that next summer. And so if you have kids in your neighborhood, um, consider hosting a club. All you have to do is uh, fill out a, a, a form, have a background check done, agree to provide a snack, and provide a, a shaded spot if it's sunny and um, be willing to have your garage door open and a place for them to meet if it rains. CF doesn't like to meet in people's homes because they like to be out in the open so that people know what's going on because we have nothing to hide. We have a, a gospel to proclaim. So that's just some announcements uh, for you to consider, to um, think about and to pray about. Our uh, scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Micah, um, Micah chapter 7, and it's the very end 
of Micah chapter 7. And I'm going to be reading verses 18 through 20. Micah 7, 18 through 20. It's uh, page 888 in your pew Bibles. Follow along with me as I, or just listen as I read. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgressions for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. So yes, we have a God who because he made a covenant with Abraham, and part of that covenant was that he would pour out his blessing on future generations and, um, and those future generations of people who would adopt the same faith as Abraham did. And so we can be thanks, thankful for that. Um, I, just a, a couple of announcements that I wanted to make concerning the prayer things. Um, Pastor Jim had his surgery this past uh, Monday. He I believe he came home, I think it was Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday, but he sent me a note and he's, he said that he wanted me to just to thank everybody here. He, he, and this is what he, he said, thank you all for thoughts and prayers, cards, phone calls, and texts from everyone before and after my spine surgery. Though painful with a long and slow recovery, it appears the surgery was a success. And he just says, praise the Lord. The pain, the numbness, and the leg weakness has been removed. That's really good news. And he says, for the first time in many, many months, the pain seems to be gone. I'm so grateful for my church family in Benson. May God richly bless your kindness. So I um, wanted to pass that on. Also, um, I, I just received word this morning that, um, that Mike lost his, his mother yesterday. So um, you can just be praying for that. So let's 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 pray as we um, as we think about all these things. Father, I do thank you that that there is no there is no God like you, and that only you can pardon sin, and you can pardon sin because you poured out your wrath for our sin on your Son Jesus. That's just, a, that's just something that is so totally foreign for us to even to begin to understand that you would have such love for us. You, there would be such a holiness. Your name is so holy and you would have such a, a burning passion for the holiness of your name that you would send Jesus to come to live as a as a, as a boy and a man live a perfect life and pour out your wrath on him for our sin instead of pouring it out on us. And so thank you for your steadfast love that remains to your children forever and ever. Father, I do uh, think of uh, uh, the fact that um, our missionary for the month, Mark, um, thank you for him and for his work in Germany and just as he is uh, seeking how he can be used by you to, uh, to share you with others, to train up others to, to know you and to share you with even more others around. And so we pray, Father, that you would uh, just increase the fruit of his ministry over there. And uh, Father, I think of the various ministries that we have in this church um, from Sunday school and um, Awana Youth Ministry, Good News Club, the, the various Bible studies that we have. Thank you for each of those ministries and uh, just pray that you would continue to use 
those ministries to to deepen uh, each of us in our in our knowledge and trust in you but father i also just thank you for the other ministry that that happens under the radar all the time of just people caring for one another uh, visiting sending cards sending notes and so we just thank you uh, for the fact that you have put that to do that kind of ministry you put it into the hearts of your people here you've put into the hearts of each of us to to love and to care for one another and that love and care stems from the fact that that we know that we are deeply loved by you and so i just thank you for that and i just think if there's somebody here this morning who doesn't know you who doesn't know what it's like to be deeply loved by a god who sees right into their heart and knows all the wickedness in their heart and still loves them and still is willing to offer them the pardon for that sin that they would respond to you even today father i just uh, think of many places in this world where um where there is no peace and where being a christian is incredibly difficult i think of uh, in Israel and Gaza, I think of North Korea. Father, I think of Ukraine. I think of uh, Iran. And I think of even Sudan, who uh, I just read about that uh, there is incredible suffering going on there. And so, Lord, we, we just ask for your mercy for those believers that are gathered there, that you would protect them, that you would comfort them, and so we just turn that over to you. Father, I also just think about many people in our church. I think of Walter and Mona. Thank you that Walter is able to come this morning. And I, I do pray, Father, that you would continue to put a song in, in both of their hearts. Father, thank you that you, um, you've sent us a, a good shepherd in Jesus. And that he has promised that no matter how d- difficult the trial might be that we're going through, he has promised to walk through us walk with us in the midst of those trials. I also just think of uh, Joyce and Linda and Sadie and Barb and I uh, thank you for them and just that uh, you have promised that you will watch over them and care for them. And Father, I also just think of of Ha Hawa and just that um, he is deployed now and I um, pray that you'd put a song in in his heart that he would know that he is as safe there as he is any other place because of you. Father, I, I also just think of uh, Tim who um, uh, this week with uh, issues with his eyes, I pray for your mercy. Father, we, we ask that you would put your healing touch that his eyes might recover um, his eye might recover and, and that sight would be back and Father even in the midst if not I pray that he would know the peace of knowing that he has a God who sees absolutely everything and knows absolutely everything and Father I think of my wife and I think of Mike who both lost their, their moms this past week and I think of my son who's um, whose fiance is is trying to get surgery to deal with a, a hernia. And so thank you that we can take all of these things to you. And I do think of our EFCA leadership, Brian Ferrone, our superintendent, Carlton Harris, the president, and Kevin Complin, who is now the, the president of our seminary. And I pray that you give, give him wisdom. And Father, I think of these others who are Uh, connected to our church um, via friendship and I pray for them and father I I do rejoice with Jim and thank you that his his pain is uh, appears to be gone and we do pray that it would stay gone and thank you that uh, I heard that he can get out of bed without help and what a blessing that is to be able to do that 
And so we just pray for your continued healing touch upon him. Father, thank you that we can, um, we can sing songs of praise to you. And so as we gather now uh, to sing songs of praise to you, Lord, I just pray that you would be honored by it and that you would stir up in each of us just a, a heart to love you more. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17. It's on page 14 if you're using the Pew Bible. Um, bow with me for a word of prayer, please. Father, I just want to thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is eternal. Thank you that your word is inspired. Um, it is your word. And um, you wrote it for our instruction. Everything that happened in the life of Abraham, as your word tells us, happened for our instruction, not just for Abraham. You were doing a work in Abraham's life, but you also desire to do a work in our lives. And so I pray that you would help us to have, have a heart that is open to hearing from you. We pray that you would open the eyes of our heart so that we might know what is the hope of your calling in our lives. What are the riches of the glory of your inheritance? And so we pray that you do that. And I pray, that, Father, that you would, um, you would use my words and you'd use them far better. Uh, this would be a far better message than, than, than I could ever imagine. And so I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, chapter and verse reference and divisions are, are a very useful thing in trying to help us find something in the Bible. I don't know if you know this, but I didn't know this. I had to look it up myself. I know it was approximately this, but there are over 800,000 words in the Bible. That's a lot of words. There are over 31,000 verses and 1,100 and 89 chapters. And because it was written before the idea of Google ever came about, search engines, none of that was ever even thought of, in order to help people find things in the Bible, there was a archbishop uh, by the name of Stephen Langton in 1227. He was the archbishop of Canterbury, and he decided to do something to help people find things in the Bible. So what he did was he came up with chapter division and he came up with verse division. Prior to that, there was none of that. And so if you had to go to find something, you kind of had to, well, it's here somewhere. But remember, people couldn't read back then and so they were more auditory. But we need to remember that the authors of the Bible didn't write chapter one, verse 1. They just wrote. They just wrote a, 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 a book. And so sometimes chapter divisions hide something. Um, and I think here in, in chapter 17, it's one of those cases. And so you'll see um, in my message this morning, which is uh, renewing the covenant, I have uh, four points. And the first point there is God's covenant is rooted in his everlasting mercy, verses 1 and 2. Number 2, God's covenant leads to a transformation in his people, verses 5 to 8. Number 3, God's covenant signs strengthen faith and point to his transformation, verse 14. And lastly, God's covenant brings about our obedience, once again, verse 14, and also verses 22 to the end of the chapter. So first of all, God's covenant is rooted in his everlasting mercy. Let me read verses 1 and 2. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. The reason why I say God's covenant is rooted in his everlasting mercy is because chapter 16 ended with, if you go to the end of chapter 16, beginning in verse 15, you'll see, and Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Abraham was 86 years old 
And now, in chapter 17, we find out that Abraham is now 99 years old. That means 13 years have gone by. 13 long and silent years have gone by. And remember, chapter 16 um, began because it tells us at the beginning of chapter 16 that Abram uh, was 86 and he had been living in the land, that is the land of Canaan, the promised land, been living there for 10 years. And God had promised Abram and Sarah that uh, they were to leave the land of Ur and they were to go to the land of Canaan and there God would bless them and one of the ways that God would bless them was giving them a descendant. And so here they had been in the land for 10 years and still no descendant. I'm guessing, you know, Abram and Sarah, you know, if they got married in their, in their early 20s, that, you know, that's 60 years, no descendant. And Sarah decided to do something, which we looked at last week, and it was something that was perfectly okay in her day. Uh, archaeologists have found other examples of, of, of couples doing this, and the idea was that that Sarah would, would give to Abram uh, her own maid, that maid was Hagar, and Abraham would have a child through the maid, and that child would be adopted uh, into Abram and Sarah's home, and that would become their child. And that's the way it was supposed to be. But you'll notice that Moses is very clear that Hagar bore Ishmael. It wasn't Sarah, because it was supposed to be Sarah. It was Hagar who was going to do it, but it was supposed to be Sarah's child, and it wasn't. And Sarah herself, who came up with this idea, didn't like the idea once Ishmael was born, and, and Hagar began to despise her, and so she didn't like the idea, but God also rejected the idea. And so chapter 16 ends with those... Uh, long, silent, 13 years. But as I said last week, I said God wasn't just interested in, in giving Abram a descendant. If God was just interested in giving Abram a descendant, if that's all his plan was, well, he could have gave them a descendant when they were, you know, 20, 25, or whenever, you know, whenever they got married. But as I said, he was interested in building Abram into a man of faith, a patriarch, that all his descendants would be able to learn what does it look like to trust God when it seems like darkness all around you. And so, yes, would God have been just to have said, Abram, you, you failed to trust me. You failed to trust me. You, you decided to take things into your own hands and try to have this son through Hagar. Forget it. I'm going to go look for a different patriarch. Would God have been just to have said all that? Of course he would have been just to have said all that. Abram blew it. But it, one of the things that I've, I've said repeatedly here is that the most, one of the most repeated phrases in the Bible is the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy endures forever. And so, for Abraham, uh, although it, he maybe thought, God, have you given up on me? No. God hadn't given up on Abraham. God comes and he says, Abram, you're going to have a descendant. But God wanted to make one thing clear, not just to Abram and Sarah, but to everyone else. This promised descendant, who we will see is going to be called Isaac, came about by one reason, by the miraculous power of God. And there's a reason for that, because as believers, we cannot live the Christian life apart from his spirit at work in us. If you're not a believer today, there's a reason why you're frustrated trying to be, trying to live an upright moral life. 
You can't. You can't because you don't know God. If you open your heart up to God, then he can do the work in your life. And so, yes, God's covenant is rooted in his everlasting mercy. Number two, God's covenant leads to and brings about a transformation in his people. I want to repeat that. God's covenant in in believers leads to and brings about a transformation in his people. Verses 3 to 8. Let me read. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. Now, up until this moment, uh, where Abram has his name changed, his name was Abram. And the name Abram meant exalted father. Now, names don't necessarily mean a lot in our culture today as much. Um, for some, maybe you, you know the name of your, meaning of your name, but many don't. And, and, and you know, it's nothing wrong with picking, having a name picked and not knowing the name of the meaning. But in Abram's day, the name, the meaning of the name was a very important thing. And, and since hospitality was also a huge and very important thing in, in Abram's day, you can imagine that Abraham had the opportunity to in, entertain many people that came through his life. In, in Acts chapter, or Acts, Genesis chapter 18, we, we see an example of how Abram sees some people and he entertains them into his life, not realizing that they were angels. But, you know, you can imagine how the conversation would be. They're, you know, sitting around, sitting around, not sitting around the table because they didn't have tables back then, but they're just sitting around um, enjoying the food and, you know, strangers come through and, oh, you're very kind to give us this food and all this kind of stuff. And, oh, by the way, what's your name? And Abram would say, Abram. And right away, people would, you know, in that culture, they would, oh, exalted father. Oh, wow, exalted father. Oh, so, so Abram, how many children do you have? And, um, you know, prior to 13 years ago, Abram would probably have said, zero. Um, oh, sorry, what did you say? Um, I don't have any. And you can imagine kind of the pregnant pause that would come about maybe the the chuckle that would cause people to think, okay, why is this guy called exalted father and he doesn't even have any children? Now, for the last 13 years, Abram could at least say, yeah, I got one. But now, notice that there is a change in Abram's name. It is now excuse me, Abram's name, to Abraham. And Abraham means father of a multitude. And so when I was trying to think about, thinking about this, it'd be like, you know, trying to think of the comparison. It was like if somebody was called Mr. Wealthy, that was their last name, Wealthy, and they lived in a rundown trailer house, people would be like, hmm, Mr. Wealthy, uh, you know, Why aren't you living up to your name? And so here, um, God has changed his name to father of nations or a multitude. And it would have even been more embarrassment to Abraham had it not been the fact that God made the covenant and God was about to do something in Abraham's life. And so I see 
there's at least four promises here that, that God reminds Abram of, because God had made the covenant already. Um, we're get uh, word of the covenant in Genesis chapter 12, but here are the four promises that I see that God reminds Abram. First of all, in verse 6, God says, God will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Verse 7, um, God says to Abram, Abram, this, this covenant is just, it just goes beyond just you. It's going to include generations after you. Verse 8, the first part of verse 8, God says, I'm going to give you this land. And verse, the last part of verse 8, um, Abraham, I'm going to be an everlasting possession for you. For you. I will be your God forever and ever. And I will be your children's God forever and ever. Now, in the short term, some of these uh, promises were fulfilled. Um, the kings that were mentioned in the Bible, um, most of those came from Abraham, including David. But when it came to owning land, um, Abraham at best maybe owned an acre of land um, uh, big enough for him to, to bury his wife in. But all of these promises, um, there is a there is an, a future uh, fulfillment in them, and through the church, uh, in particular. And I think it's very interesting that God made the promise to Abraham that kings are going to come from you. And it's very interesting in the Book of Revelation, four different times. It talks about believers. Now, not just, you know, special believers, but it talks about all believers that they are going to reign with Christ. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10 says, And you have made them, that is believers, a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Chapter 20, verse 6 Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him. 22. And night will be no more, and they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. You can also look up Revelation 24, and Paul talks about believers reigning in 2 Timothy 2.12. And so God has made kings coming from him, his loins, and that obviously is, is referring to the church. Now, I recognize that as you look around today and you, you, know, you read and you listen to the reporters who, who write, today's papers and uh, give the broadcasts on the radio and all that kind of stuff they they keep telling you they keep telling believers you need to get on the right side of history I mean I don't know who said this first but you hear this continually well you need to be on the right side of history and of course their idea of the right side of history is those people who are living with just they're just living by the dictates of their uncontrolled lusts. And they're just doing whatever it is that they please to do. And Paul in Ephesians 4.18 says that, that people, yeah, of course they live like that because they are darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from the life of God and because of the ignorance in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And so, yes, um, they live like that. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. But we also shouldn't be surprised by what that kind of a lifestyle produces. I mean, as you look around, we have massive starvation all around us. And a lot of that starvation is, is purely produced by, um, by wars and, 
um, dictators, uh, you know, slaughtering millions. And, um, you know, we have abortion. And just uh, yesterday, there's, a, there's just an abortion clock that tells you how many people that have been aborted. And just since 1980, 1.7 billion babies have been aborted. And so our society tells us, well, you need to get on the right side of history. Well, you know what? That's not the right side of history because, because we've already seen on this side of history that's, that lifestyle doesn't produce any lasting joy. And the Bible tells believers God has made us to be a kingdom of priests and we will reign with Christ. And, and so one day, a day is coming very soon. We don't know when Christ will come back. And when he comes back, those who are, who are living for him, those who are expecting and yearning for his, his coming, those are the ones who will will be reigning forever. But I think if you look carefully, even today in society, I think there are two, to me, there are very two clear signs that point to the fact of the truth of this, this passage that, that believers one day will reign forever and ever. And to me, I think one of the first ones is the, the fact that there is a Jewish nation out there. I mean, one of the one of the reasons why you have to believe in God is because there are Jewish people around. They are a people group that is, you know, close to 4,000 years old. And as you read through the, the Bible, you see a lot of other people groups that were mentioned alongside of the Jewish people. Those other people groups, they're gone. They're just kind of all mixed in with, with whoever. But the Jewish people are distinct and yet, um, they have, countless people have tried to wipe out the Jewish people over the years. And, uh, you know, last century, we had the Germans that tried it. Now we have the um, Iran and Hamas, they're trying to do it. But they won't succeed. And the reason why they won't succeed is because God made a covenant with Abraham. And going back to 12, Three, he said, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, because in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so, um, so the fact that we can see the Jewish people and still in existence in Romans chapter 9 through 11 tells us that God's not finished with them. He's got a plan for them. Now, that doesn't mean that everything that goes on in Israel um, is right. That doesn't mean that at all. It just means that God isn't finished with those people yet. And so that's a sign that's pointing to the fact that you know, God reigns. But I think the other sign that is even a much more clear sign that believers will one day reign is the church. The church has been under attack since the beginning. The day of Pentecost, remember? The Jewish leaders, they tried to exterminate, uh, tried to put a stop to it, put an end to it. They even, you know, tried to persecute the, the leaders, but it hasn't, it hasn't done anything. And uh, the Romans tried wiping them out with massive persecution early on. Um, Muhammad and Muslim conquest tried to get rid of the, the um, Christians. USSR tried it. China tried it. It's very interesting that um, what has been said is that China has actually more Christians in their country than there are members of the Communist Party. Um, Iran has tried to exterminate the Christians and, and um, those who study uh, you know, missions and things, the fastest growing church in the world is in Iran. And so those are signs that, that say that Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's a promise. That's a promise that we can count on. And so, yes, um, brothers and sisters, 
in this life, we will go through trials. There's no escaping it. No one gets that kind of life, whether you're a believer or not. But what believers get, that unbelievers do not get, is believers get the promise of a shepherd, a good shepherd, who's promised not to leave them and not to forsake them no matter how deep and dark the valley is. And, and I think this is an even bigger promise, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, God has promised to use the trials that we're going through for our eternal glory. Listen to this promise that Paul says. He says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And if you want to get Paul's definition of light and momentary affliction, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and you'll read Paul's definition of light and momentary. I wouldn't call it light and momentary. But it does tell me that my trials and all of our trials, compared to that, um, truly are light and momentary. But it also just rem- it's just a promise that I can comfort myself. I can, we can comfort ourselves that God has a plan and he's going to use it to bring about an eternal weight of glory for us. Well, number three, God's covenant signs strengthen faith and point to his transformation. Verse 9 to 14. Let me read. And God said to Abram, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout their generation. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generation, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall be circumcised. So my covenant be in your flesh as an everlasting covenant. An uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So circumcision, the act of circumcision, there's a bit of confusion here because it sounds like, well, it's a sign of the covenant and it's a covenant. But it's not, it's not the, the covenant. The covenant is a relationship. And the reason why I say it's a relationship is we know, first of all, back in chapter 12, God said, okay, I'm making a covenant with you. This is what I'm going to do in and through your life. And in verse 8 here of chapter 17, he says that, um, you know, for your offspring after you, the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, um, and... For an everlasting possession, I will be your God. So the, the covenant itself is that relationship that God has established with his people. The covenant sign, circumcision, is given to, to show, hey, world, this is my, this is my, these are mine. And, I, um, and the reason why I say that that the covenant sign points to the transformation that God would do in the heart is because of what the Apostle Paul taught in the New Testament. If you uh, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 2, verse 28, Romans chapter 2, verse 28, Paul says this, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit. So the, the outward sign which was circumcision every male was supposed to do that it was a sign of what had already been done on the inside. 
which was a transformation of the heart. And so Paul wrote what he did because at that, up to that point, the Jewish people were thinking, oh, you know what, I can live as I please as long as I have this outward mark on my body that tells me that I, I belong to God. But if you're living as you please, you're already demonstrating that you don't belong to God. You're demonstrating that you belong to yourself. The outward sign does nothing for you. Now, of course, in the New Testament, there are two covenant signs. We call them ordinances. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper a little bit later this morning. And just as the act of circumcision didn't save anyone, remember Abraham already had the covenant relationship with him, and then he had the act of circumcision. So the act of circumcision didn't save him. It just demonstrated to everybody that he was, he belonged to God. Baptism is the same way. Baptism doesn't save anyone. It's not like it's a magic key that opens heaven's door somehow. And um, like when, um, when Christianity conquered in Ukraine, um, the, the conquerors kind of put the sword up. What do you want? Baptism or death? Well, okay, I'll take baptism. And so, uh, over the years, a lot of people have, have been baptized. Them. And, and partly the reason why I say baptism doesn't save is because who's the greatest missionary that ever lived? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, he said, I didn't come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel. Now, if all it took was throwing a bit of water on people and they'd be saved. I mean, the Apostle Paul would have probably figured out a garden hose a long time ago and would have been like, well, those people are saved. And people probably would have, wouldn't have thought anything about it. Yeah, they would have been irritated if they had some nice clothes on, but it's like, you know what? Oh, I'm going to heaven. Okay, well, bless you, Paul. Bless you, Paul. Bless you, Paul. But no, Baptism doesn't save. Baptism is a sign. It's a covenant sign of a heart that has been changed. That's why in the baptism, it's the, the going under the water. I'm talking about immersion here. Going under the water means that pictures a believer who has been identified with Christ at the cross and at the grave. There's their sin has been atoned for. The power of sin has been broken in their life. The coming out of the water is now you should see Jesus for the first time at work in their life. That doesn't mean it's perfection, but that's what it means. And, you know, there's equally there's some people that think, well, you can live like the devil, and devil himself, but if, as long as I take that little wafer at the end of my life, well then, then, I'm, then I'm okay. But that, that's, that's foolishness. I mean, why would somebody on this side of eternity whose heart hasn't been changed, who wants to have nothing to do with God, why would they want to go to heaven anyway? Of course they don't want to. And so, both baptism and the Lord's Supper are ordinances that point to what God has already done. Our, our statement of faith in Article 8 says the Lord Jesus mandated two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, which visibly and tangibly express the gospel. Though they are not means of salvation, when celebrated by the church in genuine faith, these ordinances confirm and nour nourish the believer. In Eastern Europe, um, a lot of times if you ask somebody, when did you become a believer? 
they will refer back to the baptism because it was at their baptism that they actually had to take a stand. And they took a stand. Why did they take a stand? Because Christ was already at work in their lives. And so that's why, uh, that's why I say as believers, we need, to, we need to make sure we don't think, you know, putting the, the cart before the horse. No. Christ transforms the heart. That brings about obedience. So, leads me to my next point here. God's covenant brings about our obedience. Verse 14, and then I'm going to skip down to 23 to 27. Verse 14, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from the people, from his people. He has broken my covenant. Oh, why would somebody not want to be uncircumcised? Well, I don't want anything to do with God. Forget that uncircumcision. Forget that circumcision part. I don't want that. Verse 22. What did Abraham do? When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son and all those born in his house or brought with his money every male among the men of Abraham's house. And he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in his house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. So because God had made that pro- promise to Abraham and God had transformed his heart, Abraham did what he did and circumcised him. All the others with him, and this covenant relationship was uh, the sign was instituted by God's mercy to point to the fact that Abraham belonged to God. But the keeping of the sign didn't save Abraham. And the same is true about baptism. Or the, the baptism doesn't save. Brothers and sisters, when we get to heaven someday, no, when we stand before God, no one's gonna, God's not going to say, oh, so when were you baptized? Or when was the last time you had the Lord's Supper? Or, you know, were you a member of a church? Or did you, you know, when was the last time you said a prayer? Did you, when was the last, did you, did you say a prayer asking Jesus into your heart? No, no. Because what demonstrates the fact that we are saved is his spirit that is at work in us. The real issue is, do we know God and has that knowledge moved from here down to here? And if not, um, then the reason why it hasn't moved from here down to here is because we've never opened up our heart to God in the first place. Or maybe we're We've opened our hearts to God, but we've kind of hardened ourselves. And so, what God wants is for us to open our heart to him, to recognize that he is our everlasting possession. And there is nothing better than that. Let's pray. Father, I just uh, thank you for um, just the life of Abraham and just how his life was very up and down, just like our life was very up and down. But there was a trajectory of Abraham's life, and that trajectory was pointed towards knowing you and obeying you and seeking to, to know you as his God and Savior. And, um, and because of that, you were pleased with his life. We looked at a couple of weeks ago, Abraham believed God, and you consider it justified in his life. And Father, if we believe 
in Christ and what he did for us 2,000 years ago, knowing that, that we have no other hope in this world to receive forgiveness of our sins but to trust in Christ. We too will be justified. We will be declared righteous in your sight. Father, I, I just uh, pray that you would move in our hearts so that if, if we are living for ourselves, that you would even remind us through this morning as we partake of the sign, the covenant sign, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. You'd remind us of the cost of our redemption and that it came about because of the shed blood and the broken body of Jesus. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if I can ask for the servers to come forward, we are going to participate in the Lord's Supper together. As already indicated, this is a family meal. And by family meal, I mean that if you know Christ, then he invites you to participate in this meal. If you don't know Christ, well then there's no need for you to participate. But what you could do, even now, is you could open up your heart to Jesus. Frank, can I ask you to say a word of thanks for the bread?
Apostle Paul said that I received from the Lord what I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. I, I just, that after giving thanks, he gave thanks because he, not only did he love us, but he knew that his death would atone for our sin and would restore the honor and glory of his Father's name. Dave, can I ask you to say a word of thanks for the shed blood?
Apostle Paul tells us that as often as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's sufficiency for our sin. And one day, Jesus says that we will, you know, we'll drink it again with him. And so a day is coming soon where he will sit around the table with us as we participate. So let's drink in remembrance of that. just to have his way in our lives, to bless us. And it reminds me of what Moses told Aaron to bless God's people with. And you know this very well. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And then I love this part. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. Hope you have a great week. God bless.